Um, so when I got a talk accepted to KubeCon about the browser, I was honestly pretty surprised. And seeing a, a, a room full of, of, of folks excited to chat about the browser at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon is not something I expected. So um, I'm curious, who here identifies as primarily a front-end developer working on browsers? Okay, I see a few hands. Who is more like, I'm a full stack dev, I work, I work on everything? Okay, a lot more hands. SRE ops? Okay, gotcha, amazing. Well, I'm excited to talk to the browser, talk about the browser to y'all today. Um, my name is Purvi Kanal. I've worked with browsers for a large part of my career, and I'm really interested in getting front-end observability to a higher standard, especially for ops folks and back-end folks. We're used to really good tooling, um, and I really wanna see the, the browser front-end world catch up to that. I work at Honeycomb, and we're trying to solve this problem there. I'm also an approver on the OpenTelemetry JS project with a special interest in web APIs. So today, we're just gonna be going through the current state of real user monitoring and general front-end monitoring tools. Um, we'll talk about a quick introduction to OpenTelemetry and how it can also be a, a browser monitoring tool. We'll talk about the automatic instrumentation that comes out of the box with OpenTelemetry that requires no, not a lot of configuration to get started. And then we'll jump into how manual instrumentation can really supercharge your, um, your journey of front-end observability. So let's jump into it. There's a lot of tools out there today for around real user monitoring and general front-end monitoring tools. But how did we get here? There was a time where the web wasn't that complicated. It was a time to just truly like have fun, express yourself on your homepage and talk about your favorite bands or sign up for Neopets, um, which is you know a lot of where I spent my time on the earlier internet. And it really wasn't that complicated. It was a server, served up some HTML. Um, you know, we barely used JavaScript unless you wanted to play an MP3 or, or something similar. Even blinking and marquee was like all built into to HTML. So we didn't really have a lot of like complexity going on. Over time though, using the web has become no longer optional. Especially since the pandemic, more and more of our critical services are accessed online. Getting vaccine appointments, government services, and lots of other really, really basic needs are accessed through online portals. It is our job as developers to create reliable and performant experiences for our users. When our system looks a lot more complicated today with multiple databases, multiple microservices that serve um, both a browser app, a mobile app, and maybe a standalone API, and also we have increasingly complex um, engineering organizations as well. We have multiple teams working on multiple different services. So it's a lot more complex than ye old Neopets days. And to keep track of a lot of these things um, on the front end, uh, this is kind of the state of what monitoring looks like on the front end. You might have a real user monitoring tool that tells you about session information, performance information, maybe a little bit of errors and even some analytics. And then there's other dedicated analytics tools like Google Analytics um, that are maybe, that can be used by developers, but are also sometimes used by other people in the org, like product folks or marketing folks to make decisions about your product. There's also more full featured software out there, something like Full Story that even captures user sessions for you to watch back and see how users are using your site. There's error tracking with stuff like Sentry that aggregates errors and you can alert on them. There's APM tools, there's log searching, and all of these things are happening in different places. And it can be a lot to keep track of as somebody who wants to figure out what the state of their front end is at the moment. And the main thing about a lot of this is we have a lot of different tools in different places that tell us 
really well what is happening. But when it comes to bug reports or trying to debug something, I've been in this situation a lot as a front-end developer where a bug report might come in from our customer success organization saying, hey, this isn't working, the page is blank for a certain customer, and I can't reproduce it. So then I message them back and I'm like, hello, um, can you get the customer to open their dev console, take a screenshot of that, um, and then send me the error message and then tell me the exact state of how they got into it. It's a lot of back and forth. Whereas I feel like when I've been debugging backend things with really good distributed tracing, I can see things at a glance without having to necessarily reproduce it myself. So a lot of these tools that tell us well about what is happening are often disconnected from the why. And the why is really where observability shines. Observability is all about knowing how your system works because it's telling you how it works. And in order for something to tell you how it works, it has to be able to describe itself pretty well. So I'll go into a bit of an analogy here and bear with me. So I, I like to run um, and I, I wear a running watch when I'm running um, and it really helps me make decisions about my running. It'll tell me what pace I'm running at. It'll tell me um, how many steps per minute, uh, maybe even the power that I'm exerting with each step and if I'm running up a hill and how steep that hill is. Um, that helps me make, me make decisions and it also helps my partner know when to come get me if, you know, I, um, if I've, I've been gone too long, um, if I've been gone longer than he was expecting. But also this data leaves out a lot that only I know internally. So if on Monday I was running at a five minute, 40 second minute per kilometer pace and I was feeling pretty good, and on Wednesday I go for a run and it, that same pace is feeling horrible, my watch can't really tell me very much about why that's changed. But I might know. I might know that I didn't get a very good night's sleep or that, um, or that I was up really late or that I didn't eat well or that I was stressed out by something else going on in my life. My watch doesn't have that information, only I have it. And it's kind of like, um, and so what I do is I keep a journal where I self-report that information because it's really hyper-specific to my system. And this is where sending hyper-specific data about your system is really where observability shines. And you need a pretty flexible tool to make that happen. And um, OpenTelemetry is, is one such tool. So OpenTelemetry, which you'll also hear me refer to as OTEL, is a vendor-neutral open source observability framework for instrumenting, generating, collecting, and exporting telemetry data, such as traces, metrics, and logs. Um, we'll mostly be talking about traces today. The really crucial part of OpenTelemetry is that it is vendor and tool agnostic. It can be used in a broad variety of ways, in many, um, many different languages, SDKs, runtimes, it doesn't matter. You should be able to send OpenTelemetry data and have a backend like Jaeger, Prometheus, or Honeycomb um, aggregate that data and present it back to you. Um, so it's, it's really intentionally built to be flexible so that you can send hyper-specific data about your system. And it's really easy to set up in the browser. I'm curious, show of hands, does anybody use OpenTelemetry to instrument other parts of their systems today? Nice, yeah, so a lot of us are using OpenTelemetry. Is anyone using OpenTelemetry in the browser or see a couple of hands? Um, so getting started is um, installing a set of packages. There is some setup code. I'm not gonna go line by line through this code. It's also available on the OpenTelemetry docs site. But it's, it's a snippet of code um, that you wanna include at the top level of your browser application. It needs to be loaded um, before everything else so that it can fire off critical spans about your document load, for example. So you want, you want it to be loaded first. Um, so let's jump into automatic instrumentation or auto instrumentation. These are spans that form traces that you can get out of the box with, if we look at the bottom here, 
there is um, this register instrumentations function and a get web auto instrumentations meta package. This meta package instantiates some base auto instrumentations that send some basic spans about your system. It's a great place to start looking at what's going on. Um, so let's jump into what some of these auto instrumentations are. There is the document load instrumentation. And again, all you have to do is provide this meta package and it will automatically start generating document load instrumentation spans. So what do these spans look like? So there is a overall document load span at the very, very top level. And this is telling you from the point that um, a user hits the browser to the point that the DOM content loaded um, event is fired, how long that took. Um, as child spans of that, there are document fetch. There's a one document fetch span and this is when the browser received the last byte of the response of the last thing that it had to load. So if it had to load a bunch of resources, it's like, here's how long it took me to receive all of the last bytes. Document load and document fetch are slightly different because document load also includes how long it took to execute some of those scripts and things, not including um, any async or deferred scripts. And then most importantly, I think the most interesting part of this instrumentation is actually the resource fetch. So for every single resource that your browser is fetching, it will create a resource fetch span. That is every font, every CSS file, every JavaScript file, every third party JavaScript file that you load, it um, will create a span for that and tell you how long it took to load. Um, so a more concrete example of that is, for example, we've instrumented um, the Honeycomb documentation website. And this is, um, the, this is a bunch of resource fetch spans and it tells you which resource it's, it's talking about. So at a glance, I can see that, hey, there's this GIF that's loading on one of our pages that takes six seconds. I can probably do something. I should probably do something about that. Um, but it's just nice to see at a glance how, how long all of your resources are taking. The other thing about, um, about these auto instrumentations that I want to stress is that they can be extended with really critical data. Um, and I don't want to be the person to tell you exactly what that data should be because you know better than I do what your system is like. But here's an example. So, um, I was curious about which, resource, which resources loading were blocking the render. So um, there is a browser API that can tell us whether a resource that is loading is a, um, whether it's render blocking or not. And what that means is if a resource is render blocking, then, it, and it's, it's more like static files, like fonts, CSS, um, and JavaScript that like block or delay the browser from rendering the page. Um, so this can happen sometimes. Have you ever seen a page where it kind of flashes and you, it's not styled, it just looks like pure HTML and then the CSS kind of flashes on top of it? So that's because it might still render um, but the CSS was deferred. You might not want to do that. You might want to preload the CSS. So it can give you some pretty in uh, interesting information about um, whether you should preload or defer your load. Um, so I kind of stuck that in there and I said, how many of these resources are render blocking? And then I saw that I, there's a font um, and there is like my main style sheet, which allows us to like get a little bit more information and dig into um, what optimizations we can make to make our page load a smoother experience. Because it's, page load is also not necessarily about um, like intrinsically or deterministically like how fast it is, but also whether it seems fast to the user and preloading can, can do a lot for that. So that's just one example of how you can not only use the auto instrumentation, but enhance it with extra attributes that are important to you and your system. The next piece of instrumentation that I wanna talk about is user interaction instrumentation. So again, this ships out of the box with this meta package of get web auto instrumentations. 
Um, and but, but by default, it's not that interesting because all it does is track clicks if you, if you load it like this. So here's an example where um, I, I had a website where I was interested in click events and input events. And the event list that you can, that you can give it is any event, any browser events. So if you, if you go on the MDN docs and look at all of the browser events, you can pass in any of that. So that could be for mouse events, it could be for keyboard events, it could be for navigation events. It's, it's a pretty long list. Um, also, the, also by itself, um, the data that it gives you is pretty limited. So I wanted to enhance that a little bit. So looking at extra attributes that I can set, I wanna know if there's an ID on that element, I wanna know what that ID is, because by default, it gives you the target path, but in a really large application, a nested target path can be almost meaningless, so it's, it's helpful. Um, if you have data attribute IDs that you use for testing or for observability, you could pass those in here too. Um, I wanna know the type, I wanna know what's that what the class names are, and then for inputs, I'm interested in what the value of that input is. That could give me a lot of information. If someone say, hey, the search is broken, I can go and dig into that with a little bit more, infor with more information. If it's links, I wanna know the, which links um, folks are, are clicking on. And what that looks like is, so on the left here, we have just the out of the box um, instrumentation attributes. But then on the right, there's more enhanced information. So this is, I think, um, a radio button, and it tells me that it's toggled on. Um, it tells me exactly which ID it is and the type of element. So it's, it's really interesting. And what it leads to is not only helpful for debugging, but I can also do analytics um, now with user interaction instrumentation. So for our docs site, our docs maintainers uh, wanted to ask the question, hey, which code snippets are the most copied? Um, and we don't actually need to go to an analytics tool to do that anymore because we are collecting that data with OpenTelemetry and we can just run a query and say, hey, which pages have the most click events on this specific type of um, button? Another thing that um, is often really important to track are core web vitals. Web vitals is an initiative by Google to provide unified guidance for quality signals that are essential to, dis to delivering good user experiences on the web. This kind of came from the idea that it's hard to describe in, quant in a quantitative way um, what a good user experience is. So they broke it down into three major categories. Load time, which is where largest contentful paint comes from. Interactivity. Um, which is first input delay that has actually now um, been replaced by interaction to next paint, um, and visual stability, which is your cumulative layout shift score. That's referring to if you've ever been on like a cooking website and you just wanna get to the recipe, but then the blog loads and it pushes all the content down and then the ads load and then you're just like, I'm just trying to make these cookies. Please let me look at this website. That's um, That's, that's a really frustrating user experience, so they try to like quantify it. INP is more about, um, so FID was, first input delay was just kind of looking at the interactivity of the first input you might have, which is um, either a click, a tap, or some sort of keyboard event. But that falls short because we're loading lots of JavaScript these days and that's deferred. So INP actually tracks it throughout the life cycle of the page and sends the, the largest um, delay there. So it can be um, a much better, much better tool. There is no Web Vitals instrumentation available through OpenTelemetry upstream today. Um, so we created one which will eventually be available upstream. So you can, um, you can install this Honeycomb package and get that instrumentation, but I wanna be clear, this is going to be available eventually in OpenTelemetry proper. So it'll send spans for all your major web vitals. It'll tell you, if, you know, what those values are, whether they're good or need improvement. Um, but we can take it a step further. 
as well. So for cumulative layout shift, as an example, this is an example of some, some layout instability that, that's frustrating. If I know that I have a poor CLS score, there's really, like, I don't really know where to go next. I can try to reproduce it myself. Um, I can ask other people to reproduce it. I can try to play with different settings of my like network speed and see if I can reproduce it that way. But it can be a little bit of a guessing game as to what is causing that, um, that layout shift score. But it doesn't have to be because the Web Vitals like baseline package has something called attribution. So what it can do is for every single Web Vital, it can tell you which element on the page contributed to that Web Vital score. Um, so taking CLS for example, it'll um, the the instrumentation not only collects the value, but it also collects which element contributed to that layout shift score or that um, largest contentful paint or that interaction to next paint. So it gives us a starting point of where to look for um, poor web vital scores so that we can start optimizing. And it starts to connect that why a little bit better. The most important one I wanna talk about today um, especially relevant to so many of y'all that are already using OpenTelemetry to um, instrument your systems is the network instrumentation. So that is also available out of the box with the um, instrumentation meta package. Here I just have an example of there's two network instrumentations. There's instrumentation fetch and instrumentation XML HTTP request. Your application might be using both fetch and um, and like kind of more of an Ajax style to do fetching. So in which case, keep both on. If you're only using one, you can disable the other instrumentation because it won't do anything. So that's just an example of in case you need to disable one of them. And out of the box, it, um, it gives you spans for every single network request that is being made. So every get, put, post, delete, um, and this will this will include things to like third party sites. You can write filters to only capture things for your API, and you can do like fancy things like that too. But it will capture every single network request made by your browser and a bunch of metadata, which is cool. But we can take it a step further. Um, so this is really where the magic happens. If you propagate a certain header, a trace parent header. Um, then you can connect your front end and your back end network requests together, which is really exciting. In order to do that, it'll happen automatically if your app is um, served on the same like domain as um, your API. So if I'm serving from like localhost 8080 and my API is also served out of that same domain, then it happens automatically. If your API is on, is like api.honeycomb.io instead of just, and my um, UI is ui.honeycomb.io, I'll have to do a little bit of extra work to um, propagate that. And that's just passing a regex to match your backend URLs. This is telling the instrumentation, hey, for this set of, um, for this set of outgoing HTTP requests, I want you to add a trace parent header. And that's because there is a concept of context propagation in open telemetry. So signals can be correlated with each other. And the way that that happens um, in this case is by sending a trace parent header that has the trace ID in it. So that's, that would be this particular trace. That was the trace ID and um, the parent span ID of that HTTP request. And the result looks something like this. So this is really the exciting part, is that you have your HTTP request, the get request that originated from the browser, automatically connected to your API that is already instrumented with OpenTelemetry. So you can tra trace a request all the way from the browser down through to a database call and the rest of your distributed tracing. Um, and this to me is, is really, really powerful because you never have to wonder 
is it my front end or is it something in my back end? You can answer that question really, really easily with OpenTelemetry. Um, in the, in, on some front end teams, often we have to prove mean time to innocence, which is that a lot of front end teams will have um, will have bugs and stuff reported to them before everybody else, but the bug could really be anywhere in the system, and it's really, really hard to prove that it's not a front end thing, or whether your front end is slow, or is it your API that's contributing to the front end being slow as well. So you can answer a lot of those questions at a glance, um, and you can go from something like a click event, so someone did something on your website, all the way through to the database call that it made. Um, with not too much effort. So that is, is, is really digs into, it can really start to connect that why. But to go a little bit further, we've talked a lot about enhancing this auto instrumentation, but it's different than creating your own spans because you know where all of the dragons are hidden. You know, coming back to that running analogy, only you know what you're feeling like when you're on a run. And that's really where manual instrumentation shines. You know all of the nooks and crannies on your system, so you can instrument them yourself. Um, you can send spans about whatever functions you want. If there is a part of your app that is really important to you, for example, if you run an e-commerce website and you really want the cart checkout experience to be fully instrumented, you can do that manually and, um, and track things that are really important to you. So let's jump into a concrete example about that. Let's re-examine document load, because how useful do we really find document load? I personally struggle with, have struggled with it for many years, because I can see a document load that is reported as pretty fast, but I still have users that are complaining to me that the website is slow or that they can't use it in the way that they expect. And that's because with, for example, for like the document load that comes with that auto instrumentation or comes through a lot of other tools, we've decided that document, the document has loaded and this means that the user can use the website when this DOM content loaded um, has, has fired. But this might fire and we still have a lot of JavaScript that's executing, people might be frustrated trying to click on buttons and the page is totally frozen and we'll never know through through just document load instrumentation. And that was a large part of why Web Vitals were created in the first place. They're like, okay, we need to actually split up this into different categories. And largest contentful paint is kind of that proxy for, for document load. But if we dig into how largest contentful paint actually works, it's actually like, it was really surprising to me that it's just reporting the time to the largest thing on your web page. So in the example on the top, the LCP um, fires when this uh, picture has loaded because it is literally the thing that takes up the most amount of space on the page. And that seems fine. It seems like an okay proxy for the, for the TechCrunch example. But if we look at the Instagram example, underneath that, it starts to break down because the LCP fires when the Instagram logo has loaded. But the, and, and for the Instagram like login or sign up page, it's telling me, hey, you're good, the page is loaded. But there's no form, I can't interact with it. So it still doesn't feel like a very good measure of what users are experiencing. And it's, it's a bit frustrating that it's telling me that the largest paint has happened and I take that as a proxy as like the page has loaded. And ultimately, None of these metrics matter if your users aren't happy. Um, and the more important thing is for you to decide what does it mean for your page to be loaded and what does it mean for users to interact with your website. So time to first X or whatever is much more useful than LCP or document load as proxies to whether users can use your site. An example of this is for Honeycomb, graphs are kind of our bread and butter. Um, so time to first graph for this particular application is a much better, um, is a much better proxy 
to understand whether my page has loaded. But that is hyper-specific to this particular app, and your app will have something totally different in it. But that does mean that I need to set that up a little bit myself. So I can use the element timing API and give, it, and give my graph um, an ID, the element timing, and say, this is my graph, and then use the uh, performance observer um, browser API to say, hey, when this particular thing has rendered, send a span about it. And that is much more useful than an arbitrary document load or an arbitrary LCP, because sometimes LCP fires around the cookie banner, not even like an actual important element on your page. So defining what that is for you is really important. And this is just one example of no, like instrumenting your system because you know it best. Context is absolutely the most important thing. You should be adding extra information to all your spans, like user IDs, team IDs, customer IDs, whatever is important to you. You know your system the best. You can add that context through resource attributes or with span processors if it's changing every span. Because ultimately, Vendors should not determine what you can measure. You should be using a flexible tool that's vendor agnostic so that you can really describe your system in as full rich detail as you possibly can. And the best time to instrument your code is while you're writing the feature because we all, we've all been there where you come back three months later and you're like, who wrote this? And Git blame is like, it's me, I'm the problem. Um, so the best time to instrument your code really is while you're writing it. Um, and that's really all I have. So thank you so much for listening and come say hello. Oh, I don't think the microphone's on. Try again. Oh, okay. I can. Yeah, oh, cool, thanks, nice presentation. Um, and I think uh, in one of the earlier slides you showed the, like a uh, bootstrapping code, and there was um, like a URL to my, uh, to my serve, like to my metric server. Basically. Yes. Do you, do you have any um, uh, comments on how, like how do you, like should that be secured? And yes, if yes, in which way? Uh, um, and on top of that, like, any rate limiting should be implemented there, because I think our team like looked at this at some point, and we kind of were worried that uh, some of our clients may, may fi like find this and bombard us with uh, requests. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, so absolutely, you there's there's ways to secure it, and if you're worried about that, you absolutely should. Um, ideally, you would be using in production an open telemetry collector so that you're not exposing any API keys or anything. And that collector that you host um, can live somewhere that's authenticated, so that you actually have to authenticate against it before you can send spans to it. And that kind of prevents people from just getting the URL and sending as many requests as they want. You mean like the, the, the browser would, like the user, the JavaScript on the page would have to first authenticate with that, probably using like user credentials or whatever, like session or whatever. And then yeah, move. that's kind of the idea. Or however you, like you can host it alongside your API and however you authenticate with your API, it can authenticate you to um, using your collector as well. Cool, thanks. Nice. Hello? Hi. Yeah, I think it's not. So, yeah. Hi, thanks, great talk. Um, I'm actually interested in what you do after you've got those nice red, amber, green uh, health indicators and how you aggregate those and report on them later, in particular if they've got different weightings maybe because some are more important than others, um, and how you report that like over a time period. Yeah, that's a great question, and it kind of depends on, on your back end. Um, so at Honeycomb, we make pretty big use of um, service level objectives. Yeah. Um, so that's something, so there, there's benchmarks like taking web vitals as an example, um, 
Google has benchmarks for, for Web Vitals. Um, but often folks find that when they first instrument, um, especially if they have a lot of work to do, everything is just red and it's pretty, you know, not fun experience or motivating to be able to change it if you're far away. So I always, like, we always recommend um, setting those benchmarks for yourself. Um, so it can work towards the Google set ones, but you can tweak them to, um, to your own preferences and use things like service level objectives to, um, to keep track of those. And then um, on aggregate report on them using your own benchmarks rather than some like arbitrarily set benchmarks um, and that's that this is where like your back end of choice starts to come into play a little bit so I don't I don't know that Jaeger has this kind of like reporting feature um, so you likely have to pay for a back end to do that okay thanks hi hi um, question about the uh, clock synchronization. So you mentioned distributed tracing um, between front and back end. And of course, on the back end, it's easy to make sure your clocks are synchronized as far as, as I understand. The timestamp is generated in the span, so that would be the browser in that case. How do you handle that? Yeah, it's a really, it's a really complex problem. Um, and it, you basically, from, from clients, any mobile apps, at like mobile or web, it, it's hard to rely on the timestamp because of, of clock drift for, for many different reasons. Um, so that, that's, again, a, a thing that at, at Honeycomb we kind of proxy through the back end a little bit, which is that we do record the time on ingest um, of, a, of an event. And we, all, we also have the timestamp that's set by the client. And if it's egregiously difficult, like we had, um, we had some problems with a particular customer once where um, they had spans coming in from a lot of like mobile clients and a lot of those mobile clients played Candy Crush so they would change their clock. Um, and so we had to like do some interesting math to say like if the clock drift is a lot further than we think, then we use the reported like ingest time. So that's something that would be done in the collector, for example? It can be done in the collector, um, and it, or it could be done at the time of ingest of the back end of your choosing. But yeah, a collector is a great place to solve that problem. Thank you. Does it work? Y yes. Uh, hi. Thanks for the... It's here. Oh, hey. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, the instrumentation gets done on the JavaScript level, but there are some stuff uh, with redirects and happens inside the browser that doesn't come up to the JavaScript. And uh, I have seen also the performance observer never used it, but uh, are you able to catch those transactions currently? Yes, so um, a lot of a lot of the instrumentation is using performance observer. Um, in terms of catching certain things, um, there is the option to use send beacon instead of sending um, your telemetry over HTTP, which allows you to catch some of those, like let's say if you um, navigate away uh, and you want to catch any like unmount events, if you're sending through the send beacon API, it'll still be able to aggregate that and send that telemetry. So there's a specific setup for using the send beacon API to make that happen. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for the nice insights. Um, I was asking myself, did you ever reach, especially when you create your own spans, also the level where it affected negatively the performance because you added too much of a logic on the um, client side um, and it would have been better to just have a more complex query to get your insights, what you are looking for? Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say it depends, <laughs> um, but uh, I personally have not reached that limit with the span, like a, like a over instrument, like manually instrumenting, because again, um, tend to pick and choose the most important parts rather than blanket instrumenting absolutely everything. Um, 
but if like the way that I would think about handling a situation like that is understanding that maybe this telemetry I need is temporary. Like we've definitely had done those trade-offs, not so much on the front end, but I've done it on, on some back-end services of like, right now I'm having this problem and I'm going to over-instrument a little bit, even at the cost of a bit of performance, but knowing that I'm gonna get rid of that eventually once I hone in on what the problem is. 